In this lesson, we'll create motion clips for each of our animations. The first clip will be our master clip, in which we bring our character attached to the bones in the original pose. To do this, first expand the bone hierarchy. To do it quickly, hold the control key and click on the plus symbol. Then, select all the bones by clicking on the first one, holding the shift key and clicking the last bone. Next, make sure that the coordinates tab in the attributes panel is active. Then, go to frame zero and click on the diamonds to create a keyframe for each coordinate. The first column corresponds to the X, Y, and Z positions, the second to rotation. In most cases, these coordinates are the only ones that are animated. However, just in case the animations you intend to use have scale property animated, you can create keyframes for scale on each axis. Now, select the first bone in the hierarchy, go to the Animate tab, and then select Add Motion Clip. Here, we will manually set the duration of our animation, which has only one keyframe. So, set it to one, give it an appropriate name. In our case, I'll use the same name as the parent null. Finally, in this particular case, I'll activate the Scale checkbox because I've assigned keyframes to scale coordinates. Although I repeat, this is not usually necessary. Once the clip is created, you can access its own timeline by clicking on the tag assigned to the parent bone in the Attributes window and then clicking the Open in Timeline button. In the Timeline panel on the left, all the clips we create throughout the lesson will be stored. Each clip stores all the keyframes for the coordinates of each bone in the hierarchy. In the center, we could create layers to assign other objects, but not in our case. And in the timeline of the main layer, we will assign all the clips needed to create our set of animations. For our case, we'll place our first clip just before frame zero so that we don't render the T-pose in our set. You can move the timeline panel to a more comfortable position if you wish. You can also zoom in or out and pan within the environment with these buttons. Next, we will create the rest of the clips needed to populate the animation library our project requires. The process is the same, but now we don't need to create keyframes for the coordinates, and we don't have to set the animation's duration because the function recognizes how many animation frames exist. Also, there's no need to enable the Scale property checkbox since there are no animated keys. Just give the clip a name and accept it. Now, from our library, you can drag the new clip onto the timeline. You can see that the model adopts the animation we've assigned correctly. So, let's repeat the steps for the next animation. Since we'll be doing this process repeatedly, you can detach the Animate menu by clicking on the dotted line at the top edge of it. This way, the menu will remain open until we close it. So now give a name to the new clip and accept the changes. Create a clip for each of the animations. Now that you're done, you can see the long list of clips in the library. To continue, drag the next animation right to the end of the last one. In my case, my timeline goes up to 120 frames, and I can't scroll beyond that limit, so I'll set a higher number to have more space. You can see that our animation jumps instantly from idle to the walking animation. This is intentional. If you overlap one animation over another, you'll notice how the bones smoothly transition from one pose to the next, which can be very useful for other purposes, but not for ours. So make sure the clips don't overlap.
If you try to place a clip in a space between two others, and the clip is too long and doesn't fit, you'll see that it won't allow it, and you'll see a lock icon. We could drag all the clips to our timeline, but as you can see, we're reaching a very long duration. Our goal is to create sprite sheets for games, so our animations shouldn't be that long. We're already approaching 400 frames, and we only have five animations on the timeline. We'll fix this right now. When you click on an animation clip within the timeline, you can see in the Attributes panel, under the Basic tab, a property that reflects the start and end of the clip. This property is relative to the clip's position on the timeline. My idle animation lasts for 120 frames, and my goal is to trim it down further to prepare a manageable sprite sheet. So in the end property, I'll set it to 20 frames for my idle animation. The resulting effect might remind us of classic claymation or stop-motion games, and that's what we're aiming for. I'm assigning 20 frames instead of 120, and as a standard, I won't assign animations longer than 20 frames to keep the sprite sheet relatively lightweight. I should also mention that my zombie in pixels won't measure more than 200 pixels. The size is relative to each project, but generally, character sprites aren't overly large. My next animation is a walk cycle, for which I'll allocate only 10 frames of duration. But I want you to notice something particular. Walk animations often have the last frame identical to the first, creating a seamless loop. Therefore, we need to remove the last frame. To do this first, and remember to follow this order, scale the duration in the basic tab by one frame more than you want. In my case, that's 11 frames of duration. Then, go to the Advanced tab and under the Trim property, enter a value of 1 in the End field. This will remove as many frames from the end as calculated after scaling the duration, effectively eliminating the final frame of the animation that we don't want, ensuring the continuity of poses when the animation loops. So, in my case, I have a running animation, which, as I've explained, deserves a duration scale and the removal of the last frame. My next animation is a crawl, but in this case, the level of detail makes it much longer than a simple walking or running loop. So instead of scaling it to 10 frames, I'll scale it to 20 frames to maintain better detail between poses. I'll continue with the following animations in the same manner. If they are very long, I'll go up to 20 frames, or if I want them to be shorter, I won't go below about 8 frames. The playback speed in Cinema 4D won't correspond to the speed in game engines, and it's the programmer's responsibility to handle that aspect. Please pay attention to the character's feet in the hit reaction animation. When the animation ends, their feet are far from the center of the scene, unlike the other animations that maintain the center of mass and posture, identical to the start of each animation. This can lead to an increase in the required space to render each sprite frame, because our character could extend their body or move far enough from the center to go out of frame. Furthermore, it's better to give the programmer the freedom to decide how much to push the character when they take a hit, rather than defining it ourselves. 
the mechanics should be up to the programmer and we shouldn't limit them. That's why, as long as the animations stay as close to the common pivot point as possible, we create quality of life in our sprite sheets. The use of pivots to correct the position of our animations will be the topic of the next lesson. In addition to fixing the hit reaction animation, we will also correct the position of the knockdown B and stand up B animations. Now that we have all the animations correctly scaled on the timeline, we have a set of 14 animations that reach a total of 235 frames. This promises optimal sprite sheets for 2D video games.